Good morning, church. Welcome to Exeter BFC. Before we get started, there's a few announcements and things we'd like to make you aware of. If it is your very first time joining us today, we're really glad that you are attending. If we haven't connected with you yet, we'd love to make sure that we get some information from you. So if you don't mind, you can grab the card that's in the seat back in front of you. One side has two QR codes. You can scan one of those QR codes. It'll take you to an online form that you can fill out to let us know that you were here today. Or you can flip that card over and fill out the physical version of that form. When it's time for the morning offering, you can place that card in the container as it passes. Or after service is over, whether you have the card or not, make sure that you stop by our welcome desk if you haven't already, because we have a gift to give you to say thanks for joining us today. Today is our deadline for registration for our men's retreat that's happening next weekend, which is Friday and Saturday, the 23rd and the 24th. We will be hanging out at French Creek on Friday night and Saturday during the day. You can stay overnight if you'd like, but you don't have to. Luckily, it's close enough that if you would like to, you can come back to your homes and sleep at night, come back to join us the next morning on Saturday. If you want more specific information, we're going to be making some obvious announcements about that before we start with our service in person today. But make sure you talk with Nate Arndt or Andrew Eichelberger if you have specific questions and use the e-bulletin if you want to go ahead and get yourself registered today. We've already mentioned that our Sunday evening services are being replaced with our How to Study Your Bible class, which will be kicking off this September 8th, which is going to be recurring every second and fourth Sunday evenings of the month. That will also be starting at four o'clock instead of 5 p.m. like our Sunday evening services did. One thing specifically about this class is it costs $10 and we're planning on having 20 spots available for people to take the class. If you've taken the class before, it's okay. You can sign up. We will put priority over those who haven't taken the class yet if we're getting close to filling that 20 spot number. But we still would like to know how many people are interested, whether you've taken the class before or not. You'll still have to pay $10 to cover your cost of materials and everything like that. And as we said before, we just wanna make sure that people who plan on taking up one of those spots are truly invested in the class. If you have any specific questions, you can speak with me or you can talk to Pastor Bill, but the registration form for that can be found at our help desk or online with our e-bulletin. Those are all the announcements we have for today. As always, we encourage you to check out our e-bulletin to see all the different events that we have going on and coming up in the near future. One of those events, which is a save the date at this point, is Saturday, September 28th. We will have a church-wide yard sale. We were going to do this back in April, but it didn't work out. So we have rescheduled it for Saturday, September 28th. It'll be 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. here in the church gymnasium. So watch the bulletin for more details on that, but go ahead and mark your calendar if you're interested in participating. To view the rest of the e-bulletin, you can scan the other QR code on the card in the pocket in the seat in front of you, or you can visit www.exeterbfc.org backslash bulletins. At this time, we would invite you to stand and greet your neighbors, and then we'll continue on in worship together. Hey, good morning, everyone. If you want to take a quick seat, we're not going to start with worship quite yet. I wanted to just follow up on a few announcements, and then we will get into worship. Um, but you can stay standing if you would like. That's totally fine. The uh, few things 
with everything coming up, especially with all the weather we've had yesterday and today, I wanted to make an official announcement that the kayak trip we were going to do today on the Schuylkill River, River is canceled. So please don't show up to the river unless you feel like kayaking by yourself. That's, I mean, that's fine. Um, but that kayaking trip is definitely not happening. So sorry, can't help the weather. And we want to be safe for sure if we're on the water. So uh, there's two other announcements. One of those is Baby Demco is due very, very soon, um, which is exciting. I mean, it's, it's, it's not like we're unfamiliar with a baby uh, being born in the Demco household. But um, the <laughs> thing to know is that it's going to impact the youth group schedule. And this is in the e-bulletin and everything. But I just wanted to make sure everyone realizes this as we're giving warning of the baby being due soon. So we will not be having youth group for the 1st, the 8th, or the 15th of September. So those first three weekends, the Sunday evenings, there will not be youth group for all of you youth. Um, The other part of that is that it's very possible that youth will be moving to a new night starting in the middle of September. So pay attention to the e-bulletin on what that uh, is going to be. We'll get better ideas once things kind of settle. But um, check out the e-bulletin, and you can even sign up for uh, text messages for the youth. That information is also in the e-bulletin. So make sure you pay attention to that, uh, especially for September. The final thing is our men's conference or our men's retreat is happening this upcoming weekend, Friday and Saturday. So we've got some men signed up already, and you don't need to hand your cash in or anything like that for your um, the, the cost of it, which is $20. But we really want to make sure that we have our final head count of all of the men who plan on being there by today. So you can register in the e-bulletin or you can speak with Nate or Andrew directly. Nate, raise your hand just for some of the men who may not know who you are. That's Nate Arndt right there. Um, so men, speak with him before you leave church today if you plan on going. Um, and like we've said in the announcements and everything for this, you don't have to commit to staying overnight. We're just going to be at French Creek. And um, so you'll be able to come home in the in uh, Friday evening to uh, be with your families if that's what you would like to do. Otherwise, Make sure you speak with him. Get yourself registered in the e-bulletin today because we don't want to um, miss out on our, on our head count and be prepared for you. But that's all the announcement-related stuff that we have for this morning. I'm going to pray for us, and then um, we'll get started with worship. Let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, thank you that we can gather here, and whether we're catching up on news or, or events and things that are going on in our congregation or uh, we're just here to worship you, God, I pray that this time would be um, exactly that that it would be dedicated to bringing you praise and honor and glory because we believe some incredible things about you that are absolutely true, um, that you've established your, yourself here on earth. Uh, God, we want to be a part of seeing your kingdom come. Um, so, Father, please just be glorified, be magnified as we uh, prepare our hearts in this moment now to bring you that praise and honor with our worship, uh, with our song, and even with our, um, our study in your word, Father. We give you all of those things right now, and we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you're able, let's go ahead and stand together and start with worship in singing Lion of Judah. We'll sing together. You're the Lion of Judah, the Lamb who slain. You ascended to heaven, evermore will reign. At the end of the age, when the earth you reclaim, you will gather the nations before you. And the eyes of all men will be fixed on the Lamb who was crucified. With wisdom and mercy and justice, you'll reign at your Father. And the angels will cry the end of the age when the earth you reclaim you 
will gather the nations before you. And the eyes of all men will be fixed on the Lamb who was crucified. With wisdom and mercy and justice, you'll reign at your Father's side. And the angels will cry. There's a fire in our spirits that cannot be denied Cause the Father has told us for these you have died For the nations who gather before you And the ears of all men need to hear of the Lamb who was crucified Who descended to hell yet was raised up to reign at his Father's side And the angels will cry
into our time of morning prayer and offering. As the men come forward to take the offering, let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Lord, we thank you yet again for the chance to come together as a congregation this morning. Lord, we thank you that you came into this world, that you lived a sinless life, that you sacrificed yourself on the cross, and that you bore our sins. Thank you for your resurrection from the dead and for the gift and the promise of eternal life that we have in you. And that's why we gather here this morning, is to serve or to praise and to worship a risen Savior. We thank you for your love for us, for your grace, even when we are so undeserving of it. And Lord, I pray that our worship of you doesn't stop when we leave here this morning, Lord. I pray that when we leave this building today, that you will continue to help us to follow, to worship you every day, and to seek to live our lives for your glory, Lord, no matter what you have called us to do, no matter what stage of life that we are in. And I know that as we gather here this morning, Lord, that there are those who are struggling in many different ways. There are those who are going through hard times that many of us can't even imagine. Lord, I pray for your strength and your wisdom. And thank you that we can take our struggles, all our fears, our anxieties, our worries, and we can cast them at the feet of a Savior who loves us and who cares deeply about us. Lord, I pray that as a congregation, you will help us to continually lift each other up in prayer and to encourage each other. And I pray that you will continue to use this church to grow your kingdom, both here in the community and abroad. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness to this church throughout the decades, Lord, and I pray that you'll help us to continue to be faithful to you in all that we do. Lord, and this morning, we, we think, of, uh, think of our Sunday school teachers, the nursery workers, the helpers, Lord, the small group leaders, and, and many, many others who lead and serve in various ministries. Lord, thank you for the ministries that we have here, Lord, and I thank you for those who are willing to, to help in them and to lead them. And I pray that you continue to use these ministries to bring us into a deeper knowledge and a deeper love of you. I pray that you'll use the various ministries that we have to reach out into our community, to show your love, and to be light in the darkness. And as Pastor Bill comes this morning uh, to deliver your word, Lord, I pray that you'll prepare our hearts to hear it, Lord. I pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. We're going to take a moment and also let the kids be dismissed to their classrooms downstairs as those containers are being passed. Once those kids head down with their teachers to their classrooms downstairs and the containers have passed, we're going to continue with a couple more songs of worship this morning. So if you're able, please stand as we continue to sing. First with Lord, I need you and then the old rugged cross.
chorus, Lord. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. I want defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. When I cannot stand, and when I cannot stand, I fall on you. Jesus, you're my
continue uh, in our study the book of First Corinthians. Um, let's uh, continue to worship uh, in prayer before we dive into God's word. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, again, I pray that as we enter into the time of uh, exegeting your word and uh, applying it to our lives, Lord, I pray that we would um, approach your word with humility, with a clear conscience, Lord, that if we have sin, we need to clear up with you that we would do that. Lord, that we would come to your word to be changed, not to change it, not to force our own opinions upon it. Lord, again, I pray whatever I say today is of you and not of me, and anything of me that gets in there is immediately forgotten. Lord, thank you that we still have the freedom in this country to gather together and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to go through all of 1 Corinthians 8. So um, it's not as much as we did last week, uh, but we've got a lot to go through, so I'm going to read Again, we're continuing 1 Corinthians 8. We're going to do verses 1 through 13, which takes us to chapter 9. Paul now shifts. He says, Now concerning things sacrificed to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. If anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. However, not all men have this knowledge, but some, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. But food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. But take care, lest this liberty of yours somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you who have knowledge dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined, the brother who sate Christ died. And thus, by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience, when it is weak, you sin against God. Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again, that I might not cause my brother to stumble. All right, so here's where we're headed today. We're going to take a brief look at understanding 
uh, knowledge and, and love, as he kind of covers in the first three verses, very important. Uh, then we're going to take a detailed look at weak Christians and mature Christians and how that information should inform our behaviors and how to apply it in our lives. And so, again, it's important as we study God's word to understand what is the information and then how do we apply the information. So let's dive into this. Uh, we're not going to go exactly verse by verse, but we are going to look deep at a lot of these things. And I pray that it truly is for the glory of God and that it changes the way that we do things. And what we're looking at today is supposed to be a look in the mirror. Am I, uh, as I look at my own behaviors, would I fall into the category of what is defined here as a weak Christian or a mature Christian? Then what are the pitfalls, the dangers of really both sides? So that's what we're going to look at. But he starts in verse one with these words. He says, now concerning these things. Again, as you're studying God's word, this is a marker from Paul saying, hey, I'm going to shift gears. We're going to, we're going to change topics, especially in 1 Corinthians. Every time he's shifting topics, he says, now concerning these things. So it's kind of your bookends on ideas that he's going through. So we know that he's now shifting gears to a new topic. Most likely, he is yet again shifting back to, hey, now that we've covered some of these things in our former correspondence, I'm moving on to the next thing in our former correspondence. Y'all are having problems with meat sacrificed to idols. Can you eat this? Can you not eat it? It's causing dissension within the church. And this really right here is a prime example of how to apply proper hermeneutics to God's word because does this apply to us here today? I want to plug that class that we're going to be doing in September real quick. It's why it's so important, I believe, that you should come to that class on how to study your Bible. I don't care if you've already taken it. Um, don't be like one of those people. I've had a lot of people say to me already, hey, I didn't sign up because I didn't want to take somebody else's spot. Take somebody else's spot. Like when we hit 20, we'll figure it out. I mean, we can still do a little bit over 20. It's just once you hit like 30, 40 people, it's not really an interactive class at that point. And so we are saying kind of the first 20. But I really encourage you to dive into this class to attend it. It's only eight weeks starting at four o'clock. Again, it's an hour and a half additional for eight weeks on how do I properly study God's word and apply it. You take tools like what we're talking about right now and you put them into when you're studying God's word. You ask things like what's going on in Corinth, right? Understanding the context of the historical cultural context of what's going on in their town. And you try to figure out, well, how does this apply to me in my town? Is there a connector? Is there differences? Those types of things, right? Is knowing the audience here and what's going on, is that significant? Or the question can be, is there a similar issue in my current cultural context? Are there similar, similar issues that perhaps aren't one-to-one -one correlation, but I can draw out a theological principle that was true for them and is true for me? Because not too many of you, as far as I know, struggle with, is the meat that I'm buying at Costco or anywhere else that it's all super overpriced, was it sacrificed to idols? That is not a problem in our current cultural context, though, to be fair, in many places across the world, this is still immediately a one-to-one -one correlation where they are still sacrificing things to idols, and how do Christians interact with that? So let's answer some questions real quick, which will help us apply it to our lives in the 21st century. We need to be reminded that in Corinth, those individuals lived within the city. We've said this many times. Pretty much everybody around you worshiped the same god or goddess, right? This was a huge part of your lifestyle. The temple was probably nearby you. Everybody that worked or lived around you worshiped that same god or goddess. And so meat was being sacrificed to idols. And what we see here in verse 10 is, and we see also in, um, in archaeology, that the actual temples had some side rooms or outdoor gathering spaces. Really, a lot of churches have the same thing, like a cafeteria. Once they were done certain services or certain sacrifices, they all gathered together for a celebratory meal. And what was going on was that there were some Christians who were going to these meals, and there were other Christians watching this happen that were like, this is a problem. Or they just knew that there were other Christians buying meat that was being sacrificed to idols. So again, some Christians in Corinth were probably saying this. Uh, this is a great way for me to witness to my neighbor. They're inviting me over to this meal. 
after some service to Zeus. I'm, I'm going, like, just think of my area worship Zeus. They're having this big thing. My neighbor, who I want to reach for Christ, is saying, hey, after we do this, whatever they do, we're going to have a meal next to the temple. You're invited. And the mature Christian was like, okay, like, I'm going to go. This is a way for me to witness. And then the weak Christian was saying, no way, I can't do that. So there were others that saw these Christians doing this, and those, those were most likely new Christians that were either uninformed, because again, you're living in a society where you were raised your whole life to believe there's hundreds of gods. Now you become a Christian. Let's say you've been a Christian for a week or two. You may understand and have truly come to be saved, but you don't fully grasp the idea of the Trinity, or you don't understand that there aren't a bunch of other gods. And so when you're seeing somebody that's been a Christian for 10 years going to some temple like Zeus's to eat, you're like, oh, okay, this guy's going over there. They worship Zeus. Maybe there are more than one God. And you didn't know. And so that was causing a major problem for these younger Christians. Or you possibly were a new convert and you literally were coming out of that temple. So your entire life, you were worshiping Zeus. You knew that they were doing a lot of things that you had started to read the Bible and you're like, or read these letters that they had back then. You're like, oh man, I used to partake of all this stuff. I didn't know it was wrong, but I'm reading here in God's word, this is wrong. I'm being told at my local church as we gather that these behaviors are wrong. I used to partake in them. And so you're you're remembering what you used to do as this Zeus worshiper, And then you see a mature Christian who you look up to going to that temple to eat, and then you start to think, okay, maybe those things I used to do weren't that bad. And so that's what was happening in Corinth is that they were seeing these things, and they were either starting to believe, oh, maybe there's more than one God, maybe I didn't, maybe I can worship Jesus and Zeus, or they were starting to fall back into their own ways because that's what they used to live like and they saw other Christians doing the same things. There's another thing that we see in that uh, archaeology again shows us that you actually were able to buy meat cheaper when it was sold at the market and it was sacrificed to idols. And so literally there was just frugal Christians that were saying, I'm going to go to the idol market because I can get my steaks a lot cheaper than if I bought them at the non-idol market. And they're like, why not save a buck? And other weaker Christians were saying, dude, really, you're willing over a dollar? You're gonna eat something that was sacrificed to idols? And so there's this back and forth of, is this okay? Can I do this? Can I not do this? And again, we don't really see that in today's culture, but I think we can expand this experience in many other aspects of, What can a Christian do? What Christian liberties can I dive into or indulge in or partake of without offending others? When I was a part of the church plant in Boston, Massachusetts, there's a lot that you learn when you go to do a church plant. For instance, before we moved to Boston, we did two years worth of investigating Boston and the culture. With this included many trips to Boston. Me and three of the other guys would fly from California to Boston. We'd spend a week or two there going around, getting to know people, praying over buildings, praying over areas, God, where do you want us to be, things like that. And so over the two years, we came to realize something very, very unique, or maybe not so unique in Boston, but drinking is just part of the culture there. Like drinking alcohol is just what you do. I mean, everywhere there's a bar. Uh, If maybe you've ever been to like Germany, um, I've read articles that up to, I believe it was like 8% Alcohol by volume is not considered alcoholic beverage. So children can drink anything under 8%. It's just a normal drink. And so culturally speaking, that's very different than here, right? I read an article about six years ago, they banned Sprite from different places because technically there is alcohol by volume in a can of Sprite. And so they got rid of those in public schools. Those are cultural things, but we had to sit here and discuss for our Boston team plant, are we able to meet people at bars? What about when somebody says, hey, um, we're having a wine tasting at my house. You're welcome to come. Should a Christian say yes? Should a Christian say no, right? To 
What extent can a Christian engage in drinking alcohol in different contexts? This is a question that comes up a lot. And what I'm actually not going to do is dive deep into that specific scenario. Rather, we're going to look at weak Christians and mature Christians in the Bible. And Lord willing, as we inform those things, you can make a wise decision on how you handle those things in context. My family has an individual that me and my wife are close to that they tell us uh, it's, it's in a different state, but they're like, man, I love my church because we do a weekly Bible and beer. They gather together literally at a local bar, they do a Bible study, and then they drink different beers. And some of you are like, yeah, that's totally fine. But I gotta say, if you read verses like this, there's a lot going on there that we're gonna try to, again, say, if I filter this through God's word, is that wise? Do I have the liberty to do that? You can argue yes. But then we have to talk about, is there wisdom in that? What if the new convert is an alcoholic, just got out of rehab, any of those types of things? And you're saying, hey, buddy, come meet us at the bar for the Bible study. We've got to think through those types of things, and that's what Paul's talking about. So certainly, it's relevant to us in our current context. So we're going to define weak Christians and mature Christians. However, before that, I want to take a look at knowledge because that's kind of where Paul kicks this off. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies. So if you read this section and just this section, honestly, you may walk away from it thinking that knowledge is a bad thing, and it is not. It can be dangerous to be certain, but knowledge is most definitely a good thing. There is, as Paul stated here, a significant danger in knowledge in the fact that it does one thing. Knowledge often puffs up. It makes you prideful. And knowledge without love and grace, as I'm sure many of you have experienced, is a weapon that cuts down when it's supposed to be a tool that builds up. And so Paul starts with that. Yes, I do need to inform you with some things, but knowledge can be a weapon. It can be a problem if it's not attached to love. But then, of course, we also have to categorize love. What is love? And we will do that shortly. But sticking with the topic of knowledge, knowledge is an absolute necessity in the Christian life life, even though it has its dangers. See, intellectual knowledge, right? Cognitive assent only is a problem. When God's word is only up here and never comes down here, we become like a Pharisee. We have a Matthew 7 problem, which really is what Paul is talking about here, and we see some of the same language. See, knowledge of the Lord ought to draw you into a deeper relationship with him. Matthew 7 is actually full of knowledge and works, what we would label good works. However, it's all of those things without a personal relationship. Look at the end of Matthew 7, verse 21 through 23. Again, we've read these many times. They are what we would call scary verses. What is Jesus saying here? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. Again, there, there's an intellectual ascent. This individual that Christ is talking about recognizes him as Lord. This person says, Jesus, I know in my head you are Lord. They even repeat it, Lord, Lord. So they know, they understand, hey, I would label myself as a Christ follower. He is my Lord. But not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So you see what we have here in Matthew 7 is an individual who is relying on two things, intellect and works, not a relationship with Jesus Christ. They're relying solely on, I recognize you as Lord, and look, I've done all of these great things. I've cast out demons. I've performed miracles. And Jesus says, yeah, but you you did it all for you. We never had a relationship. Depart from me. I never knew you. We read the same language here in 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 3. Now concerning things, sacrifice to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Okay, so you Corinthians, you know a lot, but knowledge makes arrogant. Love edifies. 
Listen, if anyone supposes that he knows anything, he has not yet known as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is what? Known by God. Notice that he doesn't say he knows God. You can say, I know God. You can describe God. You can talk about him. But does God know you? Do you have a personal relationship with God? Because in both of these scriptures, the emphasis is put on, does God know you? Does he have a personal relationship with you? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior so that you can have a relationship with him? So again, we see here that knowledge is dangerous when you think that you've learned all that you need to know, that you've achieved something simply because you understand something. Verse two says that the moment you think your knowledge has given birth to something great, it's actually only given birth to arrogance and more ignorance. Once you think you know everything there is to know about Christ or the Bible or how to be a Christian, you have only proven that you know nothing about Christ and the Bible and how to be a Christian. Believe it or not, true story, within the last four years, I had a meeting with an individual, sat down. First thing he said to me was, and I quote, I don't need to talk anything about the Bible and God because I know everything there is to know about God and the Bible. That is how we started the conversation. And I said, I need to double check. Did you just say you know everything there is to know about God in the Bible? He said, yes. I said, I really have nothing to offer then. You genuinely are only gonna hear Bill Burton's opinion. And I promise you don't want my opinion. But you know everything there is to know about the Bible. And all that showed me was that that person probably doesn't have any relationship with the Lord whatsoever, but most definitely knows nothing about God's word. But confidently, and I mean full confidence, let's not talk about God's word. I've got other things to discuss because I know all there is to know about God's word. That's what's being talked about in verse two, knowledge that results in thinking you have everything figured out, or really that you have just about any of this figured out. When you think you've got the Bible all figured out, it's gonna end up being more damning than beneficial. See, knowledge must come from, the source must be a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Not just a desire to know more about God, right? To go deeper into your relationship, not just I want to be smarter than everybody else. Knowledge with a relationship with God is of the absolute greatest benefit for Christians and will yield fruit. And knowledge of God devoid of a relationship with him will almost always result in destruction. You need to have a relationship with him. Now, we do have to move on to weak and mature Christians, but I wanna touch real quick on loving someone properly. Loving someone properly does not equate to blind acceptance, tolerance, or non-confrontation, which the world teaches today. It's some type of love to accept someone exactly how they are and allow them to stay as they are. That's loving. That is not biblical love. Avoiding confrontation at all costs also does not automatically equate to biblical love. That is not what's being talked about here. Being weak, ignoring sin, Accepting sinful lifestyles does not mean love. I've said this before. This is my personal definition because I figured we're all talking about love all the time, especially the world. I've got to study God's word. What does the Bible say about love? And I really, really spent like years. I've got to hone down a definition of what do I think the Bible teaches on love. And this is my personal definition. I've said it before. It's doing whatever you can to put someone in the center of God's will. I believe that's love. Now we're gonna take a deep look, Lord willing, at 1 Corinthians 13 and how that plays out because in 1 Corinthians 13, it says love is, and then it lists a whole bunch of uh, actions, of verbs. Everything following that are positive and negative verbs and we'll look deeply at that. So actions, but that's not a definition. That's how you work it out. I believe the definition of love again is doing whatever you can to put somebody in the center of God's will. What does that mean? That may mean serving someone when you don't want to. We talked about that last week, and we will again. Forgiving when you don't want to. Forgiving again and again and again when you don't want to. 
It may mean being taken advantage of. It may mean being defrauded. As we read in 1 Corinthians 5, it would be better if you were being defrauded than to badmouth other Christians or to bring them to court. It would be better that they just got away with what they got away with. That would be better. That's showing love, but also love can be calling out sin. It can be breaking fellowship for unrepentant sin. Sometimes love means saying no. For whatever reason, I would say within the last six to nine months, at least once, but I would say the average has been three to four times per week, we have been getting requests at church for, I need money, I need food, I need a new car, and we're getting requests from, um, I mean, sometimes out of state, sometimes just local, sometimes very local, but consistent, consistent, hey, you're a church, I need help, I, I just need a quick dollar, can I come by and you guys give me money? most of the time it ends up being no. And you're like, that's not Christian. Why do you think that? Right? Sometimes putting somebody in the center of God's will is having boundaries and parameters. But most of those conversations start like this. Okay, I would like to meet you to try to discover why you have financial problems. Let's try to get to the root of it. Let's try to figure it out. Maybe you need a job, work ethic. Maybe you need to get a handle of your finances, things like that. Perhaps we can help you with some immediate finances, but let's also look at the long term. Out of about 100 of those calls, maybe I've had two meetings in three years where somebody actually shows up to just meet and talk about it. It's like, well, oh, you're not going to write me a quick check? Never mind. I thought you were a Christian. And that's it. But sometimes love means saying no. I'm sure many times somebody just wrote them a check and so they've stopped living proper behaviors like going to work, paying their rent on time, paying your bills, right? Those types of things, those are problems. I don't wanna feed problematic behavior, so sometimes love means saying no. How about this? Sometimes love means flipping tables. Sometimes it means calling Pharisees whitewashed tombs. Sometimes it means calling them a brood of vipers. We would say that's not loving, but those are Jesus's words, John the Baptist's words. I really do mean this, y'all. Read Jesus's interactions with crowds and Pharisees and read the sermons in the book of Acts. I mean, genuinely evaluate the words being spoken to the audience and you will see a whole new aspect of knowledge with love, of grace and love mixed together. And it's a very different definition than what the world applies to the word love. But the clear objective you will see as Jesus speaks and those in Acts is to place somebody in the center of God's will. Again, that can come in the form of encouragement, admonishment, passivity sometimes, confrontation sometimes, forgiving sin sometimes, kicking someone out of a church for refusing to stop sinning is actually biblical love. The list can be endless, but again, the Bible should define love, the world should not define love, and your personal preference should not define love. So you do need knowledge and love, but we also need to apply what does the Bible teach about those things. So I think we've covered a good bit about love, but before we move on to weak and mature Christians, I really want to talk about how the Bible says knowledge is not only beneficial but necessary. Proverbs 122, how long, O naive ones, will you love simplicity? And scoffers delight themselves in scoffing. A fool hates knowledge. How many of you have ever said the phrase, ignorance is bliss, and really meant it? I have. Right? My children, they're all about getting older, except they've recognized every year getting older means more chores. More responsibility, more homework, more things like that. And you know what happens the moment you realize that? You want to stop getting older. You want to stop learning more. You'd prefer to stay as a child. And there are many in the Christian faith that prefer to stay a child so they can excuse in their own mind their immature behaviors, their lack of behavior. That's a weak Christian. We're going to talk about that. Those that ignore knowledge. A fool hates knowledge. Colossians 1, 9 through 11, listen to this. For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and, and to what? To ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Why? So that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord 
to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfast, steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified to us, us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. So again, you can't just take this verse that says knowledge makes arrogant, but love edifies, that knowledge can puff up. So, okay, well, I, that's why I don't dive into God's word. It's just for you theologians, you professionals. I don't want to dive deep because the Bible says it puffs up. No, it can, and so you need to be cautious. However, all throughout the Bible, knowledge is shown as an absolute foundational necessity in growth as a Christ follower. That the more you know about the Lord, the more you're able to discern his will and live out his will. Peter also writes about this in what we would call the Christian ladder. 2 Peter 1, 2 through 9. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, in order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Again, the more you know, the more you're going to escape the life that you used to live. Now, for this very reason also, this is what we would call the Christian ladder, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Knowledge is absolutely necessary. See, the real question is, are you using that knowledge to help someone be in the center of God's will, or is there another motive, such as highlighting the fact that they aren't in the center of God's will? While the application of knowledge may seem similar in those two things, the intent of the heart really does make a massive difference. Are you direct or are you talking to someone about sinful behavior because you want to see them be in the center of God's will or because you literally want to shine a flashlight on the very fact that they aren't in the center of God's will? You want to kind of be elevated self-righteous in the fact that they're such a nasty sinner and by inference, I'm such a great individual because at least I'm not like them. Or when we call somebody out, right? We talked about last week with the Olympic thing. When you were offended by that, was it because you wanted these people to come to know the Lord? Was it righteous offense? That, that, That really has to be at the heart of it. Is it righteous indignation or is it personal indignation? Because there is a huge difference between wishing to help somebody or wishing to make somebody look foolish. See, these are actually one of the main signs between a weak Christian and a mature Christian. So let's look at what a weak Christian is. We must define them before we look in the mirror, and then we'll talk about if we recognize if we're either of the two categories, what do we do about it, okay? So let's discuss weak Christians. Who are they? How can you tell if you are one? And again, this is to look in the mirror, not to label your neighbor, right? Husbands, wives, no elbowing, poking, side glances, things like that. This is to really look in God's word, the mirror of God's word, what type of behavior do I have? I wanna first say this, weak Christians exist, all right? It would be foolish to ignore this and or state it in a less offensive term. It's what the Bible says. I don't want to change the language. If you notice, we read the word weak there about five or six times. The Bible labels individuals as weak Christians. There are weak Christians. If we could put up Romans 4, 14, 1 through 6, and if you could keep it on the screen for a little bit, because I'll reference it until the next set of verses. This is what Paul writes in Romans. Now accept the one who is weak in faith but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One man has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only, 
Let not him who eats regard with contempt him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and stand he will, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One man regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Let each man be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat and gives thanks to God. So again, we want to highlight things for proper growth. We want to talk about weak Christianity for proper growth. I'm not saying this so that you're like, oh man, he just labeled me a weak Christian. I know, Pastor Bill, you're talking about me specifically. I'm not here to call out like individuals. I was just about to say names, but then I'm like, I didn't clear it with anybody beforehand. But I'm not like calling you up here to be like, "Uh, Jim, hey, we made eye contact. Jim Murphy, come on up here. Let's talk about how you're a weak Christian. That is not what we're talking about here. But if those types of conversations happen, Lord willing, it's because there is a love there that's saying, hey, there's some problems in your life and and you ought to fix this because you're gonna stand before the Lord and give an account. It would be better if you knew these things. I'm highlighting these things so that you can fix them, not so that you feel less than. Again, when I address my children about issues that they cannot fully understand, I'm enlightening them. I'm not doing it to point out their ignorance. I'm actually doing it to equip them for things that are inevitably coming their way. Now, again, sometimes I do put that in my context with my own child. You're a child. You don't know what you're talking about precisely because you're a child. And sometimes there are weak Christians that a mature Christian has to say that to. I'm just telling you, as a mature Christian, what you're doing is wrong. You may not fully understand it, but you don't fully understand it because, precisely because, you are a weak Christian. But it's important to know that weak Christians exist. Unfortunately, I would say in my experience, there are more of them than mature Christians. But what does a weak Christian look like? Well, we get a list in the many spots in the Bible that talk about weak Christians. Number one, they pass judgment based on opinion. It's their opinion that things ought to be a certain way. Not biblical doctrine, not direct verses that say, hey, you ought not to do these things. It is opinion. And they pass judgment based on opinion. We see that in Romans 14, 1. More than that, they hold contempt over those that do not hold the same opinion. Oh, you don't see it the same way as I do. You don't like that same worship music? You mean you don't think we should just have a choir? Ugh, what's wrong with you? Listen, that conversation I have had a thousand times. Worship music. You want to talk about how Christians destroy other Christians, leave churches and all that stuff? It is over opinions about music. In fact, I was just uh, a pastor that I know of. He's over in the Pittsburgh area. He was talking about, you know why a guy just recently left their church? True story. They have a Bible at the front, an open Bible, that the light hits directly and the gilding on the side of the pages was reflecting and it was bothering him in his seat, but he didn't want to change seats. So he went to the outers, this needs to change. You guys need to either close the Bible or do something. They're like, just sit in a different seat. He's like, forget this, I'm out of here. Left the church and bashed the leadership on the way out. Why? Because the light reflected off the gilding of a page. You're like, that's crazy. No, I'm telling you, people leave churches over carpet color, curtain color, pastor wearing a tie, not wearing a tie. Like there's a million different reasons and almost all of them boil down to opinions. You wanna know if you're a weak Christian, you pass judgment based on your opinion and you hold contempt over those that don't hold the same opinions. Romans 14, 14, they don't weigh actions, they assign intent to those actions. That's what judgment means. Not discernment, there's discernment, right? If I see a married guy out to dinner with a female that's not their wife and I see him reach over and hold her hand, that is an action I am seeing that is a problem, unless it's his sister or mother or something, right? I find out there's no relation. That's a problem. I'm not judging the intent of the heart. I'm seeing there's an action here that's a problem. What we're talking about with judgment here is I see them doing something and I know why they're doing it. That's the sign of a weak Christian. When you see somebody doing something and you automatically fill in why they're doing that. 
Let me give you an example of all three of these in one nutshell. One person believes, a person, let's just say, by the way, I've had this discussion at length, and I'm not talking about any individual here right now. In fact, they actually left the church, but one person believes you should wear specific clothing to church, like a specific type of clothing to church. Listen, this is an opinion. All right, we covered this before, that I absolutely believe there is biblical backing that states one should care about their appearance when coming to the house of the Lord. That is biblical. It talks about that. We read that in depth even in Ecclesiastes. That's biblical. Though again, typically when somebody tells me that, they don't like how especially younger people dress these days, I I ask them why, where in the Bible does that bother you? Almost nobody can point to an actual Bible verse, but they say just because, because I think that that's proper. Again, I believe that that is proper. What we're talking about is determining what someone should wear. Specifically, I've had the conversation of a man has to wear a tie because in that opinion, it is proper. But that is not biblical. That's a contextually based opinion. So you judge others should share that opinion. And when they don't, you condemn them for not dressing up to your standard which inevitably breeds contempt. You automatically don't like somebody because of how they dress. You've seen this. Somebody walks in and that same type of individual does this. Oh, I can't believe they dress like that on the way to church. They roll their eyes. They write me emails. Pastor, I noticed you didn't wear a tie this week. Passive aggressive. Opinion. It is opinion. Usually, listen, they even go further and they imply intent. You say, they wear that perhaps just to bother me. Or they wear that because they really don't care about the Lord. They're not reverent. How about this? Maybe they can't afford a tie. Maybe they can't afford a suit. Maybe there's somebody like me that some mornings they don't have a lot of time. Something got ahead of them or children or some other stuff they go to put on what they were planning on wearing, they've realized I'm fatter than I used to be. And you can't button your top button. And I'm literally getting choked out and I'm like, I can't wear a tie this morning. I'm not gonna find a whole new outfit, but my neck is too wide. And so I'm gonna not wear a tie. Listen, I'm just gonna be honest. Most weeks when you see me not wearing a tie, it's because I didn't have time to find a different outfit. I had picked one out for Saturday morning so I don't waste time on Sunday morning. But I go to button the tie and I'm like, I can't button my tie. It's not because I'm not reverent or I'm not trying to be proper because I care about how I look before the Lord. I do. But sometimes I'm just fat. I mean, really. But we laugh, right? But people leave churches over this. They bash others because of this. That is the sign of a weak Christian. Okay, that's one example I could give many, many more. Here is a major, major sign You are a weak Christian. You easily change your mind on that opinion that you sometimes label a conviction. You're quick to change your mind. In fact, maybe you were like, yeah, I'm all about that. You gotta wear a suit, you gotta wear a tie. And then I just said everything I did and you're like, yeah, I don't agree. You don't have to wear a suit and tie all the time. I think that's foolish. You just shifted your opinion that quick. Something you would have called a conviction. Now you've shifted because somebody else now convinced you with 30 seconds of monologue that you ought to change your opinion. That's what happens to weak Christians. You shift your opinions quickly. I saw this on YouTube. That's my new doctrine that I'm gonna run with. Oh no, I saw somebody else with a different opinion. That's now my new opinion. Oh no, the pastor said now a third opinion. That's my new opinion. That's the sign of a weak Christian, that you are quick to change your mind. We see that in Romans 14, five, and we see it in Ephesians 4, Verse 14, so let me read the Ephesians verses, which also show what a weak Christian may look like. Paul writes, and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up to the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. To a mature man, right? Knowledge is attached there to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children, 
tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. So how do you know you're weak? How do you know you're a child in the faith? You are tossed and carried around by every wind of doctrine. Every time you hear something new, that's your new conviction. That shows that you are a weak Christian. By the trickery of men, by the craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And so a weak Christian changes their deeply held opinion that they're willing to fight and leave over churches quickly. When somebody that they now newly respect has convinced them of a different opinion, they quickly change their opinions. Again, mainly you're doing things or hold certain things very highly because you think they ought to be. Either because you've just always thought that, perhaps you were taught that, you were raised that way, or culturally it was built into you. Maybe some local church taught that that's the way that it has to be. But it's not your personal conviction. It's somebody else's. You didn't arrive to it through the studying of God's word. You came to determine this is where I stand because somebody else told me it. But you haven't become fully convinced in your own mind. You haven't done your own study. See, you lack proper knowledge of God's word, which is another sign of a weak Christian, according to 1 Corinthians 8, 7 and Ephesians 4, 13. You easily fall into offense or sin because you never actually learned God's word. Partly, because of this, you have a weak conscience. You think everything others do is wrong. You're so quick to just always look at others and see that they're doing things wrong. You don't even get to enjoy the freedoms that God has given you. You're busy being upset about everything else. Again, this can come from being a new convert, right? You just came to know the Lord, so you're like, I can't believe Christians do certain things. That may just be because you're a new convert and you, don't, you haven't read God's word and you're not really served, sure of certain things. But also, the Bible says that weakness can come from a dullness, from a refusing to grow. It's kind of like this, because I find there's a lot of great physical and spiritual analogies. Being saved, and, and, and uh, forgive me because I don't mean to be crude on salvation, right? But it's like having a gym membership. Like, okay, I've become a gym member. Being a gym member, does that make you strong? Sure doesn't. You can own the key card to the gym all you want, but if you don't go there and train, you're not gonna get any stronger. And so 30 years later, you can claim all you want that, yeah, that's my gym, and technically it is, but you're not gonna be strong because you've never gone and trained. And it's the same with God's word. Yes, I'm a Christ follower. He saved me, but I never dive into his word. I never grow. That's the sign of a weak Christian. Or perhaps you do go to the gym and you do one exercise and one exercise only. You, you go there and you walk on the treadmill and you leave. That's fine. You're gonna gain a slight bit more endurance, but no other part of you is going to be strong. And that is what happens with a lot of Christians. This is why a lot of Christians are weak, which we will read here very shortly. Another sign of a weak Christian is that they don't serve the body of Christ. Ephesians 4, like the whole chapter is all about, if you are saved, part of what you're supposed to do is serve in the church. That's how the church grows. And I'm not just talking numerically, I'm talking through actual spiritual maturity. It says the mature church grows because people are serving. So if you're a Christ follower and you're not serving the Lord in your daily life and at your local church, you are a weak Christian. That is a sign of a weak Christian. And just like the dullness, which we'll read here in Hebrews 5 in a second, here is what a weak Christian always needs. They always need a teacher. It's not year one, hey, Pastor Bill, what do you think about this verse? It's year 20 of, I've been a Christian for 30 years, and man, I just, I'm so confused by this whole, like, election thing. Really, you've been in the Bible for 30 years, and you still haven't studied up on election? Oh, I've never, Pastor Bill, I've been a Christian 30 years. I've never heard this topic talked about before. Have you read the Bible? I'm not just talking election. I'm talking 
all different kinds of things. You want a sign of a weak Christian, it is that they always need someone to teach them God's word and they never get to the point of teaching God's word. How do I know that? I'm not just trying to be, again, rude or anything, right? We're trying to point out things that the Bible says you ought to be aware of. Hebrews 5, 11 through 14, concerning him, we have much to say. And it's hard to explain. This is right after he's talking about Jesus and Melchizedek and the, the uh, relationship between Jesus and Melchizedek. And it's like, if you don't know who Melchizedek is, there's a problem, right? If you've been a Christian, I'm just saying right now, you've been a Christian a couple of years and you still have no clue who Melchizedek is. I don't think you read your Bible. Like when you're reading Hebrews, you ought to be like, yes, this relationship that they're talking about, the correlation between Jesus and Melchizedek totally makes sense to me. Why? Because Melchizedek's at the beginning of the Bible. So I would like to think you read Genesis, you came across this and you're like, I'm a little confused by this. You read Psalms, you read Hebrews, and you're like, Melchizedek keeps coming up. I'm gonna look into this. I'm gonna learn how there's a correlation between Jesus and Melchizedek. I would think, right, that you would know this. And he's, so he's talking about Melchizedek before this. Concerning him, we have much to say. It's hard to explain since you, listen, Here's why it's hard to explain. You become dull of hearing. You, you keep coming to church, but you're not listening. You're not applying. What does he say? For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. You have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food is for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Why? Because of practice. They are consistently in God's word. So you want to know the sign of being a weak Christian is that you are always having to require other people to tell you what the Bible says, tell you how you're supposed to live. You never are fully convinced of your own on how you're supposed to live for the Lord. That is a sign of a weak Christian. The final one before we move on to a mature Christian and close out, you're short-sighted. You're worried only about getting through the moment and you're still stuck in your old habits. You're not allowing God's word to transform you. Again, 2 Peter 1.9 closed out with this as he read the Christian ladder. For he who lacks these qualities is blind and short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Those that aren't growing are blind and short-sighted. They're just concerned about quick, gratification, self-gratification, which we have also covered in 1 Corinthians and the problems with that. That is the sign of a weak Christian. So let's quickly move on to the sign of a mature Christian. Again, one, they exist. However, it is important time to point out that these aren't fixed positions. A mature Christian can have moments of immaturity and repeated patterns of immaturity, but those repeated patterns of immaturity will do what? They'll revert the person to a weak Christian. So again, just like with your body and exercise, you stop exercising, you become weak again. You can be a mature Christian, but if you think you've reached a level of, I can't now fall back into old sins, as we even read here in 1 Corinthians 8 2, you're a fool. You need to keep growing. You don't reach this pinnacle of Christianity of, now I know everything I need to do. I don't need to stay in God's word. I don't need to be a part of the local body. I don't need to serve. I don't need other Christians to help me. That's, 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 that's a mature Christian who becomes arrogant and puffed up and is guaranteed that a fall is around the corner. Be disciplined, stay in God's word. Romans 15, one through two, Romans 15 really talks about mature Christians, but we're not gonna read all of it. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Let each one of us please, or let each of us please his neighbor for his good to his edification. So again, there are strong and mature Christians. We see that, we've already read that in Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 8, Ephesians 4, Hebrews 5, in Romans 15, we're talking about contrasting, comparing, contrasting weak and mature Christians. Mature Christians are knowledgeable. Again, we saw that all throughout the verses that we've read so far, as well as in 2 Peter and Colossians. A mature Christian is going to be a knowledgeable Christian. A Christian ought to know God's word. And they apply that knowledge with love. And they intend to draw other people closer to God's will with that knowledge. Mature Christians know their limits. They know their weaknesses. They're not works-based. And they don't think that everything depends on them. A mature Christian denies their liberties 
for the benefit of others, which is what Paul is especially talking about here in 1 Corinthians 8. Does a Christian have the right to go have a beer? Yes. Listen, we've, we can argue that all day long, but I'm telling you in the Bible, a Christian can go have a beer. You're not gonna show me a verse that says it is wrong for a Christian to have alcohol. It is wrong for a Christian to get drunk. It is wrong for a Christian to drink certain types of alcohol. There's different uh, original Hebrew and Greek words for strong drink, wine, alcoholic beverages, and strong drinks are highly pushed back against throughout the Bible. So I would even say that really a Christian ought not to drink anything hard liquor. I, I, would, I would be able to back that up biblically. If you wanna argue that with me, that's fine. Come to my office. You bring me your verses, I'll show you mine, and we will talk about how we make decisions based on that. But I do not believe that the Bible says it's wrong for a Christian to drink a beer. However, especially reading this verse, is it smart whatsoever to say, I'm gonna have a Bible study and we're gonna meet at the bar? Every Bible study, bring your new favorite beer. That's not mature. That's foolishness. Because you have no clue what each one of those men is bringing with them. You don't know about their history. You don't know about their wives. You don't know about their struggles. And it is one of those things that is what you could call a Christian liberty that many people will stumble in. Listen, you, you're married, you take your anniversary and you fly out to Taiwan and you're no way gonna see anybody that you know and you wanna have a beer at dinner, knock yourself out. But you wanna be like, hey, come over to my house after church, we're gonna have a small group study and we're gonna drink beer together. It's just not wise. You're not thinking about the other individuals. You're thinking more about your liberties and your enjoyment than the problems that it may bring. And that's all throughout our Christian life. There's a lot of things that maybe you're enjoying that you shouldn't. And the sign of a mature Christian is like Paul says at the end, if my eating meat, you're assuming it's from idols and it's causing you to stumble, what does he say? For the rest of my life, I'll be a vegetarian. I'm assuming that's a big deal. Because if I'm Paul, I'm raised as a good Jewish person, I've never eaten bacon or steak. Now Jesus comes along and says, you can eat steak and bacon. He was probably eating bacon, bacon wrapped filet mignons like every day. Then people were saying it's a problem. Now Paul's like, I can't have that anymore. Like I would say that's probably a problem. But Paul says, hey, who cares? If that's one of the cultural things that's causing my brother to stumble, I'm gonna remove it from my life. Do you have the right to go to certain movies, to wear certain clothes, to watch certain things on Netflix, certain music? Fill in the blank. You have the Christian liberty to do those things. Jesus Christ died on the cross. He'll forgive you if you overstep. They're all of those things, absolutely. Is that what a mature Christian does? No. A mature Christian doesn't stand up and say, I'm justified in my behavior. A mature Christian says, I'm gonna be cautious in my behavior so as not to cause weaker Christians to stumble. Yes, weaker Christians shouldn't be so easily offended. The sign of a weak Christian is offense. You're easily offended, you're a weak Christian. It's just what the Bible teaches. You have no problem offending people with personal behaviors, personality, opinions. That is also a sign of weak Christian, not a mature Christian. Again, you can offend with God's word, but let the Holy Spirit do the convicting. Let God's word do the convicting. I've said that many times. I'm okay if people leave the church because I preach God's word and they disagree. I hate it when people leave the church because they don't like my personality, which happens. And I can understand that. I really can. All of us can rub people the wrong way sometimes. Try not to, but what we ought to do as a mature Christian is Look around, will this cause somebody else to stumble? If so, am I willing to give up my Christian liberties as to not cause somebody else to stumble? A mature Christian knows their giftedness that the Lord has given them and serves in the local body within that giftedness. If you have still been saved for a period of time and you're like, I have no clue what God gifted me in, why not? But that's not a sign of a mature Christian. A mature Christian says, I know where God has gifted me and here's how I'm using that gift. A mature Christian is fully convinced of what they do with their lives and in their lives. They have proper biblical conviction that nobody can push them off of. I'm not talking about just arrogance. I'm talking about you have spent your life dedicated to God's word and so you know why you believe certain things. You can trace it back. A mature Christian looks to others as more important than themselves. 
they're a slave. They have the full mindset of Christ. Don't, we're, we're gonna close soon, I promise. Philippians 2, we've just, it's, this is important, okay? Philippians 2, you want, the right, you want a mature mindset. The Bible spells it out for you. If there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there any, is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Listen, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but for the interests of others. Again, attached to 1 Corinthians 8. Yes, you can do these certain things. You have the liberty in Christ to do them, but is it going to be harming others? And if it is, don't do them. Do it in proper context, proper season. But verse five, why? Have this attitude in yourselves. Where do we see it emulated perfectly? Which was also in Christ Jesus. And it tells us how who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He says, you wanna look at a mindset of of humility, a mindset of self-sacrifice, look to the mindset of Christ, who even though he was God, said he was going to lay down the autonomous decision-making of God and submit to God the Father for a season. Whatever God the Father says he's going to do, even up to the point of death on the cross, that is what we are called to, that same mindset. God, you told me to live this way for others, I'm gonna do it even though it's self-sacrificial. A mature Christian has a long-term mindset. I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. We read that last week. So how do we apply this as we close? We Christians, simply put, number one, you have to grow in knowledge. Get in God's word. Like I plead every week for this, but this is like so clear in what we've just read. You wanna stay immature, you wanna stay weak, stay out of God's word. You wanna grow, You want to live for the Lord? You want to glorify him in your actions? Spend time in God's word. Number two, we Christians, if you look in the mirror and you listen to those things, you're like, man, that really does apply to me. Don't be so easily offended and don't be so opinionated. And the way you guard against that, listen, the way you guard against that is that you must be able to trace back your offense or your opinion to the Bible. For example, worship music. Some of you say, I love this worship music, I hate this worship music, or you say it more this way. That music was bad, that music was good. Here's my question, why? Why was it good or bad? When my wife makes a meal, spaghetti and meatballs, three people in the family say that was a good meal. One says that was not a good meal. I don't phrase it that way. She makes it well, she prepares it proper, nobody's getting sick, that's an opinion. My opinion is, I didn't care for it. It's not my style. The kid's opinion is, I did. But neither of our opinions make it a good meal or a bad meal. Those are subjective, right? There are objective things. So here's the question. With worship music, can you trace your opinion back to God's word? When you say, I don't like that song, and then you say, because it disrespects God, and you draw it to God's word, I'm with you. Okay, when you say, I don't like that music because it's not upbeat enough, show me in the Bible where that makes it a bad worship song, that Jesus can only be worshiped with drums or can't be worshiped with drums. Again, you're like, I can, cool, we can talk about that. At least you're fully convinced in your heart that you can trace it back to God's word. But my guess is most of us have been living our lives of that was a good sermon, good music, a good service based on opinion, not where you can trace it back to God's word. How about this one, y'all? What are your thoughts currently on Israel? What are your thoughts about the war, Israel and Hamas? Are you somebody who gets very upset over Israel and you automatically defend everything Israel does? I'm not telling you that's good or bad. What I'm saying is, why do you do that? Why? I mean, why do you think that way? Seriously, you're like, because I'm a Christian. 
Christians are always on the side of Israel. Fine. Why? Can you, as you get really angry about anybody talking bad about Israel, can you show me a verse that backs up why you feel that way? And I'm not saying they don't exist. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying, can you, who are taking a stance, point back to the Bible? Sometimes we stumble into Bible verses. I've taken this opinion my whole life, and and it's actually biblically correct, but you've actually been standing your ground your whole life because it was your opinion. But you can't back it with God's word. Do you understand what I'm saying? A lot of us have stumbled into the right opinion But if you're only standing on it because it's your opinion, that's arrogance. When you're standing on it because it's God's word, that's proper, right? That whole Olympic thing. I don't want to dive into that too much again. And all y'all are like, it's already late. I understand. We're almost done. I swear. But the latest meme, because I just saw this. It's because all your devices are listening to me and somehow connected to my devices and making the computer show things is the way it works. Because I mentioned it last week, that meme is like popped up everywhere. I even saw it this morning. And, and, it, and it said something along the lines of, it started with, as a Christian, I have no right to judge who you love. But then it had this, you know, the picture of the Last Supper, then it had this picture of whatever happened at the Olympics. And then below that one, it said, but once you insult my faith, I now reject who you love. Something like that. That's so foolish. Everything about that is so foolish. One, as a Christian, you can love whoever you want. What are you talking about? Nobody can love whoever they want. Why are you telling me as a Christian, I'm supposed to respect the fact that you want to love whoever you want? Come to me and tell me you love my 12-year-old daughter. See what happens. Right? Go to any father in here and tell them your feelings towards their minor child. Oh, but you can't tell somebody that they're loved towards a man and another man or a woman. What are you talking about? That's not Christian. That's not biblical. It is absolute, that's, that's an American thing. No, I, you're an American. You can't, t- you can't impede on other people's rights. What are you talking about? Trace it to the Bible. Those things are wrong. I don't now get to flip it because you've insulted me. Like, that's insanity. But unfortunately, that's the way a lot of weak Christians live, is that they trace things back to their opinion, not the Bible. And so again, if you get offended because of how I dress, worship music, one Sunday, the children's, the whatever it may be, offense happens. But can you trace it back to the Bible? If you can, you ought to approach that brother or sister, talk about it, right? Sign of a weak Christian, highly opinionated, easily offended, almost zero to no biblical backing as to why. Mature Christians, what do you need to know that a huge pitfall and a clear problem for mature Christians is that we do not apply knowledge with love and that we do not live self-sacrificially. Also, Christians, mature Christians, you use God's word to build up or tear down. You must put yourselves above others. Listen, including at times, poor, perhaps forever, your freedom. Because as a slave to Christ, you do not want your freedoms to cause others to stumble. It is important what we do. All right, let's close in prayer. Um, I'm just going to, I'm just going to close. Yep. Well, normally we, we, we sing, um, I've gone like really long, so... I'm going to close in prayer, and then y'all can stand, and we'll read the benediction, all right? Dear Heavenly Father, um, Lord, again, I don't want to make light of not being able to read a clock or things like that, but Lord, as I study your word, Lord, I knew that this would be uh, a little bit longer, but God, as we read your word, how important it is that we understand it that we have knowledge of what you require of us, what you desire from us that we would spend time knowing your word, but then, Lord, to transfer it from our head to our hearts, to apply it. Lord, again, I think all of us can look in the mirror and see ourselves as weak Christians at times. And Lord, may we look at that not as a call out, not as an insult, but as a factual statement that we are weak and that we need to grow. Weak people are more likely to be attacked. Weak people are more likely to do damage when we need them to be strong. And so, Lord, for each of us, as we have those moments of weakness, may we have enough clarity, enough righteousness before you through your son that we would come to you and say, Lord, help us. 
that when we're called out on things, we wouldn't just be offended as that is another sign of being weak, but that we would look to say, what do I need to change? How can I grow? Lord, for mature Christians, for those that know you and have walked with you and understand your word and are growing in it consistently, Lord, may we be cautious in how we apply your word. Lord, that we don't use it as a sword to cut, but as a sword that is a tool. Lord, thank you for giving us your word, for giving us your spirit. Lord, I pray that we would apply these lessons to our lives. I pray that we wouldn't use the freedoms that your son purchased on the cross to make others stumble, that we would abuse those because you died for them as well, as Paul points out here in 1 Corinthians. God, thank you for your word and how we can dive into it and grow in it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all can stand and I'm gonna close with the Aaronic benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. You're dismissed.